Okay, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, and good evening, everyone. Um, I see the number of attendees is uh, still uh, increasing, uh, but it's uh, sharp the hour, so I think we can start. So welcome to this webinar. My name is Alessio Rocchi. I'll be acting as a, as a moderator for, this, uh, um, for today's uh, session on an update uh, uh, about the current status of the upgrades of uh, LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA in view of uh, OP4. Um, we have uh, four speakers uh, today. Um, Anna Maria Effler for, uh, for LIGO, um, Matteo Tacca for Virgo, and uh, Yuichi Asso for CAGRA and uh, Patrick Brady for uh, um, LSE, uh, as a spokesperson who will uh, tell us something about the plans uh, in view of, uh, of O4. In this uh, session, I will be helped out by uh, three panelists, uh, Peter Fritschel, Yuta Michimura, and uh, Mikal Vass, um, which will uh, uh, help us answer the questions at the end of uh, the seminar and uh, during the question and answer uh, session. So uh, let me uh, get started and uh, hand off uh, the word uh, to Patrick uh, about the plans for O4. Thanks, Alessio. Good morning, everybody. So I'd like to be, next slide, please. So I'd like to begin by giving you a brief update on the LIGO Virgo CAGRA observing runs and our current plans. The image you see on the right-hand side of this slide is from the 16th of March. It shows on the horizontal axis, the years stretching from now through uh, the end of 2028 and shows two sets of observing runs, the observing run four, and observing run five. The current plan for observing run four is that it will start on the 15th of December, 2022. It will last for one year with a one month mid run commissioning break. We anticipate doing engineering running before the start of the run in order to commission and ensure that we're at stable operations and uh, adequate sensitivity. And during that period, we may release alerts um, that are uh, not considered full on observing alerts, but are part of the engineering period when if we detect significant events. The other item that I want to mention this morning is that we may extend the 04 run if scheduling for 05 upgrades makes that viable, but you'll see in a moment how we plan to discuss that. One of the important features of the current diagram is to extend um, it into uh, future runs and the one thing to bear in mind with this is that the 05 schedule on this diagram is tentative at the present time. It is based on estimates of the upgrades and the time for the upgrades that are needed between the end of 04 and the start of 05 for each of the detectors. Um, so we will again take a closer look at that as we um, go, go through 04 and uh, approach the end of 04 so that we know what's going to happen for 05. The other thing that's going on at the moment is uh, development of post-05 upgrade plans to improve the sensitivity and stability of the instruments that we have for observations that would continue past the end of this decade. They're in a tentative state at the moment, and we will um, begin to have some discussions of those in the future. Um, and of course, the one thing to always mention is that uh, continued observations are subject to funding, um, but from our perspective, we, we plan to move ahead with those. Next slide, please. The other thing that I want to mention this morning is how we want to approach discussions related to running and observing runs for the LIGO Virgo Cagra network going forward. The first thing you should be aware of already is that we have been giving quarterly updates 
on uh, observing run plans as we get ready for 04. One of the things that you've noted in those updates is that we've um, told you about the delays that have arisen from the pandemic due to interruptions in staff being able to get to the observatories um, and other laboratories, interruptions in the supply chain and other delays of those kinds. Um, and in particular for 04, that means that we're actually starting about a, about a year later than we thought we would be before the pandemic hit. Um, going forward, we're going to restart the um, what we're called open LVEM uh, meetings in preparation for 04. Um, they'll be LVKEM, really. I put K in brackets only because the mailing list and the setup is, is currently named open LVM. The webinar today is targeted to provide an update on the uh, detector upgrades that we've done for 04 across LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA. Um, but what we will do going into um, May, June is to begin to have some virtual town hall meetings. There'll be one hour sessions, four to six meetings between now and the start of 04. Those meetings will focus in on the technical information about alert distribution, uh, gathering uh, input and feedback and sharing information among everyone who's interested about uh, plans to follow up on alerts. And then um, during those meetings, we'll also begin to have some discussions related to run duration in, to the extent that there's any flexibility. Going forward, we have some other topics that we also want to address. Um, the first is that we are aware that um, LIGO Virgo CAGRA operate as within the framework of multi-messenger astronomy. And there are many missions and projects that are, are gearing up in order to allow us to have multi full suite of multi-messenger observations. So we do want to figure out a way to establish a common location for information sharing about what projects are active and proposed and timetables. Um, we hope to also adopt or establish a workshop related to coordination of active and proposed MMA projects. And we also will want to discuss the trade-offs um, in 05 and post-05 plans. So with that, um, I'll hand over to our next speaker, Alessio, back to you. Thank you so much, Patrick. And uh, we move on to the next slides and that's on LIGO. So I will call to Ana Maria. Hi, uh, my name is Anna Maria Fleur, and I'm a scientist at LIGO Livingstone Observatory. So I'll tell you about the LIGO specific upgrades for a four. Now, LIGO operates two detectors, one in Hanford, Washington, and one in Livingston, Louisiana. But uh, the upgrades are identical for both sites, even though they may be done out of order. Next slide, please. So, as a summary of the improvement goal, um, first of all, we want to increase the circulating arm power in the interferometer um, by a factor of two. Um, and so that would, in theory, increase our sensitivity by a factor of square root two. Uh, we want to increase the squeezed light efficacy to 4.5 dB from 2.3, 2 to 3 dB in 03. Both of these uh, would address higher frequency um, noise. And then for lower frequency noise, we need to implement this 300 meter filter cavity for frequency dependent squeezing. So in 03, we did frequency independent squeezing. So for that, I'll point you to this drawing on the right hand side of the slide. So you can see kind of the semblance of an interferometer. The laser is coming in from the left, goes down the X arm and down the Y arm four kilometers to the end patient comes back and towards us, is the output of the interferometer. And so we've added this entire other skinny looking tube that is 300 meters long, two new vacuum chambers, an entire new vacuum tube enclosure and an end station in order to make this uh, 300 meter filter cavity happen. And in addition, we also need to reduce the low frequency technical noise. Um, and then we'll go into details later. So next slide, please. So what does this look like in terms of sensitivity if we want to look at the strain spectral density as a function of frequency, right? At what frequency are we uh, going to improve? 
So this compares the Livingston O3 spectrum um, in blue with maybe some of the best we can imagine uh, spectrum in orange for O4. So at high frequency, you can see that uh, by doubling the laser power and um, somehow making more squeezing happen, we can reduce that. But the problem is, let's talk about quantum noise for a second. So um, at high frequency, we're dominated by the shot noise component of the um, quantum noise, which is kind of a phase noise. And then at low frequency, we're, we're dominated by radiation pressure, which is sort of amplitude noise. And so when we do squeezing, we basically have the option to reduce the error in the measurement of phase noise at the detriment of amplitude noise or vice versa. And so what we've done in O3 is we've reduced the high frequency noise, the, the phase noise, but we've increased a little bit um, the resulting quantum noise at low frequency. And so we were starting to see a bit a bit of that in O3 with only 3 dB of squeezing. So we actually cannot do more squeezing without addressing this. And the only way to address that is to have a filter cavity that helps you kind of at each frequency rotate the amount of squeezing you apply to either the phase or amplitude um, error rate. Which one do you improve? Do you improve more? the um, shot noise or more the radiation pressure. Um, and so the resulting filter cavity that we need for the LIGO parameters is 300 meters. And that's the reason for it. And of course, at low frequency, uh, we also have a lot of technical noises. Um, and so you don't win that much from the filter cavity if you don't also reduce the technical noise. Um, next slide, please. So let's go through the um, topics I had in the first slide. How do we reduce quantum noise, right? So first, let's, we want to double the arm power to 400 kilowatts. Well, we need a bigger laser. Um, now, the making higher power lasers is kind of an established technology, so it's lower risk, but it still required a complete rebuild of our laser system, and this picture uh, on the left here is from Hanford, where they've already done this uh, upgrade. This is only kind of half of our um, laser system pictured here. So that takes time and there, there are still challenges, but um, they've shown it can be done. So that's great. Uh, and then the bigger problem is we have these little point absorbers on the test masses, um, which when the laser beam lands on them, they heat up locally. Um, and they're so small, you can see them in this little uh, microscope picture here. Um, and so what they do is they effectively cause losses in the arm, such that the arm power increase, it doesn't actually give you more sensitivity. Um, so that has limited us in the past for going to higher arm power. Um, now we are working with the vendor to eliminate them. Um, and it will require one input test mass change at Hanford. Uh, they've already done this. Uh, and it will require two N test mass changes at Livingston. I'm gonna use test mass and mirror uh, interchangeably. So I hope, I hope that's clear. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the other part of the quantum noise, we want to do more squeezing and frequency dependence, right? So the addition of this 300 meter uh, cavity. So on the left here, you can see um, a photo during the construction of the Livingston um, beam tube enclosure. Uh, you can see a little human there with a red hat for scale um, and the skeleton of the beam tube enclosure. Um, and it's starting to be covered. You can see that white paneling. Now that's one aspect of it. So we need a frequency, um, sorry, we need a filter cavity in order to also squeeze at low frequency. But in order to get more squeezing, we need to have lower losses in the system. And there are kind of two aspects of that uh, superficially. One is, of course, you want all your surfaces to have no losses. Uh, so for that, we have installed better Faraday isolators. So the picture in the middle is a picture of the output Faraday of the interferometer newly installed. 
um, at both Hanford and McGinn. And we have also implemented active mode matching. So if we're not well mode matched from the squeezer to the interferometer, from the interferometer to the output mode cleaner, which filters um, uh, the gravitational wave signal, um, then you know we're gonna we can risk losing 10, 15 percent here and there. Um, so we've implemented active mode matching, which means uh, through different um, methods, either thermal or piezo, we actually can change the curvatures of the mirrors in the system um, inside the vacuum system. So this one of these um, active mode matching suspensions is shown on the right. Uh, it's a double suspension. You can kind of see the blades at the top and a little um, pinkish surface down there. Uh, that's the actual mirror. Next slide, please. Uh, so then also we also need to reduce the low frequency technical noise, right? Otherwise, we don't win that much from the filter cavity. There's a few different aspects to this, um, and it's kind of a headache that we all have to deal with. Uh, so we can, uh, some of the things that we are addressing are scattered light, um, controls noise reduction. We can also do subtraction, um, installation of better electronics where we find that um, they are limiting our sensitivity. Um, now for scattered light, um, we have installed a lot more baffles. So if we think of scattered light, there's kind of two components that can be attacked, right? Light escapes the system because no optic is perfect. So um, it just bounces off the surfaces around, picks up the motion of the surfaces, comes back, small fraction comes back and reinterferes with the main view, right? So you can either reduce that light, so we install baffles everywhere, or you can also reduce the motion of the scattering surfaces. Um, and so we've done some of that with by damping some of the high Q resonances of mechanical surfaces that were um, scattering light into um, our system. Um, and the picture here shows um, the one of the output chambers of LIGO is human for scale, and it also shows where the new squeezer beam is going to be um, injected. Next slide, please. Um, the next item I wanted to talk about is duty cycle improvement. So we are also always thinking about the duty cycle. Um, it's quite difficult to get above 85% duty cycle per instrument. Um, so that's kind of our goal, I think. Um, in O3B, the duty cycle was about 75%, which resulted in a 50% triple coverage with LIGO and Virgo. Um, now, one of the bigger um, things to blame here have been uh, high Q resonances of suspension. So we are addressing those by installing passive dampers inside the system. So for example, we are addressing the uh, beam splitter bounce and roll modes. Those you can see are already installed on the right. They're about this big. Um, and in the future, we plan to address the violin modes, which are the modes of the actual fibers that hang the test mass. Um, and they're at about 500 Hertz. And so we plan to address them with this, with the addition of this tuning mass. So we put this mass that we tune very perfectly to the, um, vibration of that particular uh, mass and we attach it to the mass above the mirror. So the mass that suspends it. Next slide, please. So how do all these things fit on a schedule? This is the entire ear. Uh, so at the top in kind of reddish is Hemford and at the bottom in bluish is Livingston. Uh, you can see we're kind of doing the same things, but a little bit out of order. Uh, if we go to the orange, the, let's say dark yellow, you can see that because we've had to completely disassemble our old squeezer system, put it in a new chamber and re, um, recommission it, that's kind of what's, what's been going on. So frequency independent squeezing alignment and commissioning. So we have to get that working before we're ready to include this totally new filter cavity. 
hopefully by then the filter cavity and uh, all the construction that's still going on uh, will be done. Uh, Hanford has already done their laser upgrade and their test mass swap. We still have to do that. So we've linked those together to kind of minimize the downtime. Uh, and then there are these little blue periods where we have time to commission the flow interferometer to see the actual effects of all these installations on the low noise uh, curve that's available at that time. Um, so we have a few periods here and there. And then in, the, in this pre-04 commissioning, uh, Alessio, I don't think all my slide is showing. Anyway, um, in this pre-04, can you go back? Uh, in the Spear 4 commissioning period, um, I'm kind of lumping in all the uh, stuff that you sometimes happens in engineering runs, um, if you know what that is. Uh, so including low latency alerts and data quality and so on. Okay, next slide, my last slide. Uh, so this is a different way to look at the sensitivity that we expect from 04 comparing to 03 and looking forward to 05. Uh, which is part of why we are implementing some of the A-plus upgrades for 04, even though they were initially meant for 05. And you can see through the fatness of the gray curve, which is the uh, 04, that's kind of our uncertainty. And I would say our biggest uncertainties are our mirrors, our technical noise reduction, and how well we mitigate the losses in the whole system. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna Maria. Um, let's move on to, to Virgo. But before doing that, uh, let me remind everyone, I see that uh, somebody still is already using that, that there is a, a question and answer capability online by just pressing a small button in your uh, Zoom window with question and answers. And with this, I leave the word to Matteo. Yes, thank you, Alessio. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I will go through the upgrades that uh, we are doing in Virgo uh, for a four. So next slide, please. Here you can see uh, just a schematic view of, uh, of the experiment uh, with the list of the main, uh, the main upgrades that we are, we are doing, we are installing, starting from, from the input of the, of the experiment uh, also in Virgo, we would like to increase the circulating laser power. So we, we have to, to change the, the, the high power laser with, with a new one that will allow to, to send more higher power into the interferometer. Then uh, still uh, at the input side of the, of the experiment, uh, we needed to install a new payload for the input multilinear cavity to improve the controllability and then stability of this uh, of this cavity and together with that we profited to install also an instrumented baffle uh, that has a sum for the diode installed on it in order to directly measure the, the, the amount of scattered light inside this cavity then moving towards the, the interferometer uh, there is the, the most challenging uh, i would say upgrade that is the installation of the signal recycling mirror uh, towards the output of the, of the experiment that will allow us to, to change the, the shape of the sensitivity curve. And together with that, we had to install some uh, an auxiliary system for auxiliary laser that will allow us to control all, all, the, all the cavities. Then at the output of the interferometer, we, we installed the new output multilinear cavity that uh, will, uh, will help us in reduces the losses and also low noise photodiode in order to reduce the impact of electronic noise. Uh, as uh, in LIGO, we are planning to install also the frequency dependent squeezing system uh, that, uh, that means the installation of a new cavity uh, parallel to one of the R mode interferometer together with the squeezing source. Uh, finally, uh, in the experimental building of, of uh, Virgo, we installed also an array of seismometer in order to be able to measure uh, the, the level of Newtonian noise. And in a second st step, we will uh, try to, to reduce and to, to, to cancel the, this, uh, this Newtonian noise that we are going to measure. So next slide, please. 
Here is a view of the sensitivity curve that Virgo uh, reached during Go3 in the blue curve. This is compared with the, with the band uh, light, in light blue, <clears throat> that is uh, the target sensitivity that we would like to, to achieve uh, for a four. And uh, starting from the, from the high frequency bandwidth, uh, so we would like uh, to, well, the improvement is connected mainly to the installation of the signal recycling mirror. That is, uh, as I said before, it is uh, um, allowing us to, to change the shape of the sensitivity curve. And together with the increase of the input power and uh, a higher level of frequency of squeezing, this time we will try to, to, to inject frequency dependent squeezing. Then uh, if we go, to look at mid range frequencies, so about 100, 300, 400 hertz. Here you can see that the shape of sensitivity is changing, that it is mainly due to the installation of the, of the signal recycling mirror. And finally, at low frequency, also we will uh, go to, to handle uh, technical noise is in order to, to try to reduce their impact. And also we would like to profit of the frequency dependent squeezing. So uh, in, in order to reduce the, the impact of the radiation pressure. So next slide, please. I'm going through the, the main uh, upgrades that, uh, that we implemented in Virgo. In particular, the, the first one was the installation of, of the signal recycling mirror together with the, the auxiliary laser system. So the goal for a four is to implement uh, the signal recycling cavity that will allow, as I said before, to change the shape of the sensitivity. And uh, let me say that make uh, this new cavity working properly is the most challenging upgrade that, uh, that we are facing right now. So we had to install uh, a new complete payload. So when I say payload, I mean uh, uh, the, the system that is made by the mirror, the marionette that will allow us to, to control the position and the angular um, tilt of the, of the mirror itself, the, the thermal actuator, the, the baffle around the payload. And uh, introducing this new cavity, we will have uh, another degrees of freedom that we have to, to control. So in order to have all the knob to control of the degrees of freedom, we needed to install an auxiliary laser system that is uh, uh, made of uh, green light that is sent uh, from the end station to the central area uh, of the interferometer. So on the bottom uh, left, you can see a picture of the new installed payload. In the mid uh, picture, you can see one thermal actuator that is installed on, the, on this payload and the green light that is produced to control the cavity. Next slide, please. As I said before, we would like also to increase uh, the amount of circulating power inside the interferometer. In order to do that, so we would like to, to achieve a level of about 200 kilowatt of circulating power. In order to do that, uh, we, we, we need a higher power at the input of the interferometer. So we needed to install a, a new monolithic fiber laser that uh, will allow us to, to deliver a maximum of about 75 watt injected into the interferometer. Uh, let me say that we decided to keep uh, uh, the former multi-stage laser amplification uh, on the bench in parallel uh, to, to the new one in order to have already a spare system when needed that is, uh, that is ready to be used. On the picture, you can see the two, the two systems, one close to the other. Next slide, please. At the output of the interferometer, we, we installed also uh, new, we, may, we installed new upgrades. In particular, the goal for row four is to reduce the losses at the output of, of the experiment by about a factor of two and to improve the filtering of spurious field uh, by one order of magnitude. And moreover, we would like to, to mitigate the impact of, of the scattered light. In order to do that, at first, we needed to install a new output mode cleaner cavity. Uh, in the past, we, we had uh, two low finesse cavities, uh, one in series to the other, while now we, we have one high finesse output mode cleaner cavity. You can see a picture of it on the, on the, left, uh, on the left. And uh, not only at the output of the interferometer, but I would say 
more, more or less everywhere on the optical benches of the experiment. We installed new baffles, new beam dumps, new absorbing glass in order to, to, to absorb and to, and to cut spurious and ghost beams that should, should be around and should be the source of, of scattered light. There are a couple of pictures as an example in the, in the two other pictures of, the, of this slide. So next slide, please. Uh, the other uh, huge uh, upgrade is the, is the installation of frequency dependent squeezing system. The goal is to reduce the impact of the shot noise at high frequency without spoiling the low frequency. So reducing at that point also the impact of the radiation pressure noise. This means that we have to install a frequency independent squeezing source and we have to inject the squeezing beam before into a filter cavity and then into the, the interferometer. Here there is the sketch of, uh, of the implementation of this, uh, of this system in Virgo. And there are also pictures of, of the different components. Uh, as in LIGO, we needed to change a bit the infrastructure, but uh, we were lucky and we have enough room to install the vacuum pump of this cavity in parallel to one of the arm of interferometer. So the, the infrastructure work in Virgo were lighter than in LIGO. On the other picture, you can see that the suspended mirrors, the optical benches that are used for this new system. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so to summarize the current status of Virgo, all the major upgrades have been successfully installed. We are now working on the interferometer with the power injected that is about uh, 33 watt, meaning that we have circulating power in the, in the cavities that is about 140 kilowatt. I can say that uh, the, the full interferometer is now controlled, so also with the, with the new signal cycling cavity, but it is not in uh, an optimal working point. And this configuration, in any case, is giving us a lot of indication about the current limitation. So we are now working on the optimization of the working point. In parallel, we were able to install and to commission the frequency dependent squeezing and uh, we succeeded in achieve uh, frequency dependent squeezing at about 40 hertz. That is our target. And now we, are, we have to work to, to optimize this system. So next slide, please. So what are the next steps? Uh, as I said, for the interferometer, the first next step is to improve the current working point. That means that we have to, to improve the mode matching, improve the global alignment, reduce uh, the, the control noise, a tune at the thermal state. So we have really to, to work on the working point of the experiment. And then we will uh, try, we will try, and then we will start to produce a repeatable estimation of the sensitivity curve. In parallel, we are working on the optimization of the frequency dependent squeezing uh, since we need to improve its, its stability before injecting in, into the interferometer. Uh, I would say that in one month, one month and a half from now, we will also start uh, the campaign of noise hunting in order to, to find the, the sources of the noise that are limiting the, the experiment uh, in order to reduce uh, them to improve the sensitivity. And also we will start soon uh, uh, the preparation of the injection of the frequency dependent squeezing into the interferometer. As you can see in this, uh, in the, in this graph, uh, uh, we will work for the next couple of months uh, on the optimization of the working point, but together with that, we will start also the noise hunting activities and the frequency dependent squeezing injections, since also this can give us some indication on how to improve uh, the experiment. And this is all for Virgo. So please, Alessio, thank you. Thank you to you, Matteo. And uh, we can move uh, to Kagra, uh, Yoichi. Okay, hello everyone. So I'm gonna talk about the uh, 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 status of Kagra for O4. So next slide, please. So Kagra uh, is a three kilometer, three kilometer long interferometric gravitational wave detector uh, being constructed in Kamioka in Japan. Um, it has uh, uh, two unique and sort of challenging features which are uh, cry, uh, underground site and also cryogenic mirrors for the reduction of the thermal noise. The project was started about 12 years ago and uh, we performed the initial joint observation in 2020 with GEO 600 
uh, which is called O3GK. Um, the best binary range at that time was uh, about one megaparsec, which means we need to do a serious work in order to get to a reasonable sensitivity to be able to actually detect the gravitational wave. Um, next slide, please. So in order to know what is necessary to improve the sensitivity, let me start from the uh, noise curve of the Kagura at that time. So the orange curve shows the measured noise of Kagura during O3GK and the various colored uh, curves sh show the uh, contributions from uh, various noise sources. So uh, let me start from low frequency. Next slide, please. So uh, up to 100 Hertz, um, the, mainly the noises of the Kagura was limited by so-called local damping control noise. And what does it mean by the damping control noise? Next slide, please. So um, it is a noise from the control. So the, the mirror of the interferometer um, are suspended by a multiple stage pendular for vibration isolation, but they, this pendular have uh, a lot of mechanical resonances at low frequencies. So at low frequencies, the mirrors will move a lot without any feedback control. So um, ideally, uh, we can use the interferometer signal for the feedback control of the mirror to stop the low frequency motion. However, um, there are degrees of freedom which cannot be well, uh, sensed well by the interferometer. Next slide, please. So we need to add a local sensor to each suspension for the damping these degrees of freedom. Uh, unfortunately, these local sensors tend to be much noisier than the interferometric sensor. So uh, while at low frequency, they are effective in reducing the uh, large motion at low frequency, but in the observation band, the high frequencies, this local sensor can introduce extra noise. Uh, next slide, please. That is the reason for this low frequency noise. So next slide, please. Um, so what we're gonna do, this is a schematic of Kagura. And as you can see, we, can, we have a lot of mirrors. Next, please. So uh, after O3GK, we've been upgrading most of the suspension systems for the mirrors. So uh, next, please. Um, so more concretely, what we are doing is, first of all, uh, we have several mechanical components in the suspension system which are not working well or broken. So obviously, we had to uh, fix these mechanical failures. And after that, uh, we have been improving uh, uh, various local sensors like uh, accelerometers, ABDTs, optical levers, and so on. And also, uh, we are improving the uh, balance of the actuators between the suspension stages. And all of them in, uh, combined uh, allows us to better optimize the damping control filters for the suspensions so that they will not introduce extra noise at low frequencies. So this is one important upgrade for Kagura. Next, please. In the middle sensitivity as frequency range, like hundreds of hertz, uh, the, we are limited by the acoustic noise coupling. While we haven't fully understood, understood the, the uh, coupling mechanism of the acoustic noise, next please, the most likely culprit for this noise is the scatter light uh, uh, scattered off of the main mirror and uh, uh, hitting the vacuum chamber wall and come back to the interferometer. Now, when this vacuum chamber wall moves uh, by acoustic vibration, uh, this scatter light gets extra phase noise, and that's going to translate into the extra noise in the output of the interferometer. So to stop this kind of scatter light from coming back to the interferometer, we have prepared additional optical buffers, and we're now installing these buffers. Next, please. Also. So uh, finally, at high frequencies, we are limited by the short noise and the laser noises, which are related to the laser power and the stability. Next, please. So um, the natural place to improve the, this noise is, of course, re replacing the laser. Next, please. So uh, we are uh, planning to replace the, our high power laser from 40 watt one to the 60 watt one. Now, note that the uh, although we have 40 watt laser, um, in, during the OCGK, we were able to only use up to five watt because we found that this laser's intensity noise increases a lot uh, above that power level. 
However, with this new uh, sick to water laser, we confirmed that uh, with a full, almost full power output, the intensity noise is actually lower. So uh, we're, uh, we can uh, use a lot more power during OFO. Uh, next, please. And uh, uh, we are also improving the uh, output mode cleaner. Uh, next, please. So the problem with our uh, current OMC is that the transmissivity was kind of low, like 80, only 80%. 80 so we replaced the mirrors and now the transmissivity is uh, about 95%. Also, um, so we have two DC fault dials on the uh, output mode cleaner, which are used to do the finally detecting the gravitational wave signal. So these are the most important fault dials. However, uh, during your 3 gk unfortunately, one of the PD was broken. Uh, so by fixing one, uh, we can effectively double the gravitational wave signal, which is good. And uh, next, please. And finally, uh, we have the signal recycling mirror here, um, uh, which is used to, to uh, uh, shape the uh, changes, optimize the shape of the quantum noise to uh, have a, a better sensitivity. However, uh, during O3GK, next, please. Uh, we operated in the parameter with uh, uh, maybe one slide back. Yeah, thank you. Um, we operated the uh, interferometer with signal recycling mirror uh, tilted because uh, locking the signal recycling cavity uh, requires uh, a lot of tricky uh, tuning of the control system and we didn't have enough time to do so. However, the problem is that the SRM has 70% reflectivity. So this means 70% of the gravitational wave signal was just thrown away at the mirror, uh, which is not good. So uh, next please. Um, for O4, uh, we installed extra gate valve so that we can isolate the vacuum chamber for the SRM. And we're planning to replace the SRM with a transparent one so that we will not throw away 70% of the light. Uh, next, please. So uh, also we are doing the upgrades on the vacuum and the cryogenic systems. So the problem with the, the O3GK uh, vacuum system was that we didn't have enough number of pumps. And uh, uh, because of that, the vacuum level was not so great. And uh, that means a lot of more, uh, residual gas molecules are flying around. And when you have a lot of molecules flying around and, and still you, you, uh, if you cool down the mirror, then the, these molecules will stick on the cryogenic surface of the mirror and uh, accumulates the, the molecular layer, which means the kind of frost develops. And uh, that was the reason we couldn't cool down the uh, mirrors for O3GK. But now we have installed a lot more in pumps to have achieved a better vacuum. And also, just in case the frost still develops, uh, we installed the heaters for quickly removing the uh, frost. So uh, uh, we're hoping that uh, we, we're reasonably, reasonably confident that the, in OFO um, we can operate the interferometer in, at the project temperature. Next, please. So um, this is a schedule for OFO. Uh, currently, we are finalizing the uh, hardware upgrades, uh, which will continue until the end of the Ju uh, June. And uh, in July, we will close down all the chambers and uh, pump down the, all the vacuum system. And uh, uh, we will spend three and a half months for the interferometer commissioning after that. And then do the engineering run. And then in December, our 4A starts. Now, uh, at the time of the beginning of the uh, O4A, uh, the expected uh, uh, binary range is around one megaparsec, which is basically the same as O3GK because um, we don't have enough time for the commissioning. So we don't expect too much improvement at that time. And it doesn't make so much sense to continue observing with such a low sensitivity. So after about one month, Kagura will go back to the commissioning mode again and then we will focus on the improving the sensitivity. And Kagura will be back to the observation sometime during O4B with an improved sensitivity. And we plan to have uh, the participation in O4B for about three months. Uh, next, please. Um, this is a, a possible scenarios for the O4 sensitivity. So uh, basically for O4A, as I said, uh, one megaparsec, 
uh, is a, a kind of canonical number for the O4A sensitivity, but uh, because we're replacing the SRM with a transparent one, and also, also we've been working on the reduction of the technical noise, especially the suspension improvement, we may, if, if you're lucky, we may be able to go up to three megaparsec. And then for O4B, uh, we are planning to do the cryogenic operation. And depending on the level of the technical noise reduction, we're expecting to have somewhere between 10 to 25 megaparsec in O4B. Okay, next slide, please. So this is a summary. Kagura has been conducting the upgrades in uh, the hardware upgrades uh, in various subsystems. And then uh, the plan is to join O4 from the beginning with uh, about one megaparsec binary range, uh, but we will leave the observation in the middle to improve the sensitivity and we'll be back to the observation sometime during the O4B with an improved sensitivity and uh, I hope to uh, participate in the last three months of O4B. Uh, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yoichi, and let me thank uh, actually all the speakers. Um, so let me summarize uh, what we discussed today and what we saw. So O4 is uh, um, planned to start on uh, December 15th uh, on the, this year. Uh, the length is, uh, is one year as it was for uh, O3 with one month of commissioning break exactly in, in the middle of that. Uh, we may be able to release uh, uh, alerts uh, during uh, the engineering run uh, before the beginning of the run. Um, that's, that's still been uh, um, prepared. And uh, uh, there is also a chance that the length of the run might be uh, extended uh, depending on, on the uh, plans uh, for the O5 uh, uh, upgrades. But of course, uh, if this uh, possibility becomes more concrete, uh, we will uh, um, signal that uh, well uh, in advance. Uh, concerning the status of the detectors, uh, um, though, so we, we heard from the speakers that uh, activities are uh, ongoing at the sites, the all four sites to finalize the installation of the upgrades uh, in view of four and to commission the detectors in order to achieve and reach the expected sensitivities uh, um, for the next science run. Um, as discussed, uh, there are some technical uncertainties there, uh, which, are, uh, which, which remain and which uh, of course may uh, impact uh, the schedule that is uh, uh, the beginning of the run. In any case, um, we, uh, as uh, LVK collaboration, so we'll continue to review the schedule and the plans uh, in, in a quarterly uh, um, cadence uh, so that uh, every three months we will uh, uh, issue an update. Uh, other than that, as Patrick announced at the beginning of the webinar, uh, we will uh, restart the open LPK EM uh, meetings uh, in preparation of for four uh, to update not only on the status of the detectors, but also on the status uh, of uh, the uh, general preparation of the science run from different points uh, uh, of view. And uh, with this, uh, uh, um, I, I conclude uh, and I thank again uh, all the speakers uh, and uh, uh, all the panelists uh, and the organization of this uh, webinar and everyone for, uh, for coming online. And uh, there is uh, still time for some questions if you want. Uh, as, as I said, there is a question and answer button on top of your, um, of your uh, uh, Zoom um, bar. Uh, <clears throat> I see questions are being asked uh, uh, online um, and the solar. Well, that's you. Perhaps I'll just uh, answer uh, Mandeep's question sure. uh, about LIGO India Live. So the LIGO India project is progressing. Um, they've made a, a lot of progress in, in terms of building their test facility and generating the capabilities in India for it. 
they've also acquired the, the land for the observatory. The final funding for the construction of the, of the detector is still awaiting final approval for, by the uh, Indian government. So that's the, the current status of uh, LIGO India. Do you want to field the Alessio? Do you want to sort of field the other questions to people who could answer them live? Yeah, sure. So um, there is a, a, um, a question about uh, how long uh, the O four A run will be. Uh, let let me take that very very quickly. That's supposed to be six months. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and then there is uh, another question from, from Barack about the uh, an, an effort to release auxiliary channels of O3. Of, of uh, and what is the plan to release data for O4? Um, I think, Patrick, uh, that's for you as well. Thanks, Alessio. Uh, thanks, Barack. Yeah, the, um, first of all, let's talk about uh, auxiliary channels. So there's a release of a small set of auxiliary channels um, that was already made for O3 around um, one specific event. The idea behind that was to gauge interest in use of them. And we understand that it's only very limited and therefore can only be used in a quite a limited fashion. Um, but we'd still be interested to know uh, what use is made of it and if people uh, have an interest in seeing uh, the data released for um, other parts of the run. The, the long-term goal is from the LVK is that we do have it in our minds that attempting to release at least a subset of auxiliary channels is something we'd like to do, but right now the uh, we, we don't have personnel uh, available to appropriately document all of that. So it's, it, it's something where we need to understand better um, the usage models and, and desires of the community, but we'll be as responsive as we can be with subject to funding. The uh, second point that, Bar a question that Barack asked is the plan to release the data, um, you know, for, um, let me give the remind people about what our strategy is for the strain data in O4. Um, so our current plan for O4 strain data is that after acquiring six months of data, we will uh, wait. Well, wait is not quite right. There will be an 18 month lag before release of that strain data to um, the public. So the O4A will be released after uh, 18 months after the end of it, and then O4B will be released 18 months after the end of that. The Again, the same answer really applies for the auxiliary channels. Um, we Our plan is to get there and be able to release those longer term, but at the moment um, we're, we're still trying to gauge the level of interest from the community and also figure out where we would get the effort to do so. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, I see there are other questions coming on, online. Uh, there is another one which I think you might want to take because it is from George Ishman and asking how much extra dollar time uh, we can expect uh, for a BNS event uh, with uh, uh, the Planet 05 sensitivity. Yeah, I think um, uh, so. Uh, George, I don't have a, a very precise answer to that question right now. Uh, a lot still depends on the sensitivities and in particular the low frequency sensitivities. It also will depend on the signal to noise ratio that we acquire. The, the typical numbers we carry are that if we got a very loud event and we had good low frequency sensitivity, there are it, the we could have an early warning alert for a BNS uh, a minute or several, a couple of minutes before uh, the merger, but that is a very tentative number. We will discuss the details of early warning alerts in our town halls later in, in the summer and into the fall so that we have more precise answers to that question for you. Thanks, uh, Patrick. I think these uh, fact that we will update uh, uh, more in the town also, also applies to the question by Aaron asking whether the scheme of the or the format of the alerts has been finalized. 
Yeah, and again, Aaron, the, the, the that I, I kind of tried to give a little bit of a, an answer related to that earlier. The the details of the changes should be coming out in the early part of the summer, uh, but that's uh, again a tentative date right now. Uh, but over the summer, you can anticipate seeing the new format uh, discussed more broadly and examples of using it and other updates that are needed um, coming into place. Perfect. Thanks again. Um, I see there is uh, one more question from Kunal about the LIGO India timeline. Um, I don't know if you want to say a few more words about that. I, th <laughs> I think on that one right now, we don't have any better information from it. Uh, the project team in India are working as closely as they can with the funding agencies there and with the government to figure out when final approvals will be available. We're all uh, looking forward to having an extra interferometer in India. It will bring uh, great scientific capabilities when it joins the LVK run, so run uh, or network. So, um, so that's as much as we really have for you today on that. Thanks. Um, there is uh, <clears throat> then another uh, um, question uh, from uh, Mark Luthi about sky localization for BNS early warning. I think, uh, let me suggest that all of these questions related to the early warning capabilities and the actual capabilities of sky localization are best postponed to the later uh, town hall meetings that will begin in late May or early June. So please bring those questions um, back to those to those town halls as we as we have them. Perfect. And then uh, there is uh, uh, another question from Norbert in this is directly in the chat, uh, whether the town halls are going to be held face to face or not. Everything right now is for the town halls is intended to be by Zoom. Um, there are a number of workshops and um, going on in other venues where there will be LIGO Virgo Cagra representatives able to say a little bit about runs. For example, the uh, IAU General Assembly in uh, in Busan in in Korea will be a venue where there's some discussion of global coordination of multi-messenger astrophysics, but there are other meetings too. So you can anticipate uh, having some small groups of people who can give information at different workshops, but the actual town halls are intended, currently planned to all be on um, Zoom. Thank you so much. So um, I don't see uh, further uh, questions coming up in the question and answer um, dialogue box. And uh, we are then at the end of the hour. Um, so I guess um, we can thank again uh, everyone from, for coming online and paying attention to this webinar. Thanks again, the speakers and uh, the panelists and uh, then i think we can close uh, uh, the webinar here thank you so much <laughs>